My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church, located on Nicollet Mall in beautiful downtown Minneapolis, and I'm the moderator of the forum. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's guest speaker. For over 20 years, Valerie Plame served as a covert CIA operations officer, working to protect America's national security and to prevent the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. In 2003, she found herself in the midst of a political firestorm when her role as a CIA operative was revealed in a nationally syndicated column, resulting in her resignation from the agency. Since leaving the CIA, Plame has become a public advocate and respected authority on issues of national security, counter-proliferation, and politics. She's an active leader in the Global Zero Initiative, a movement to build a world without nuclear weapons. She's the author of two books. Her first book, Fair Game, is an autobiography recounting her years with the CIA. In her just released novel, Blowback, she and co-author Sarah Lovett have written a story, quote, about a female covert operative who relies upon her intellect more than high-tech weaponry to gather intelligence. One wonders if that's fiction or fact. <laughs> In tonight's presentation, Security, Surveillance, and Privacy, Ms. Plame offers her perspective on issues of international security, government accountability, and protection of the public trust, all timely topics given recent revelations. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, Valerie Plame. Good evening and thank you. What a delight it is to be here. I'm really honored. I've heard about the forum and now I understand why. A gorgeous venue, a beautiful place. And uh, plus, I'm always happy to be in Minnesota where you send such an interesting array of politicians to Washington. <laughs> <laughs> you never know who you guys are gonna send. The fact is, I'm in the middle of this book tour for a blowback, and uh, it gets really old after a while talking about yourself. So I am really thrilled to talk tonight, I have an opportunity to talk about some real world issues and not just fiction. I've been asked to speak about national security and privacy. So it's appropriate that I first give you my credentials for doing so. I served my country as a covert operations officer for the CIA. I went through intensive paramilitary training, which included how to fire a variety of weapons. I survived interrogation exercises, weeks of uh, escape and evasion sort of exercises in the woods. And then I also did operational training where you learn spy tradecraft, that is how to conduct clandestine operations. For example, how to spot, assess, develop, and recruit assets that will provide intelligence to our policymakers, how to detect surveillance, clandestine communications, how to write intel reports. In the CIA, I developed my expertise in nuclear counterproliferation, essentially making sure the bad guys, whether they're terrorists or rogue nation states, do not get weapons of mass destruction or nuclear weapons. In the run-up to the war with Iraq, I was the head of worldwide operations to obtain intelligence on the genuine state of Iraq's presumed WMD. We targeted and recruited scientists, investigated their procurement networks, tried to figure out what was the state of their R&D, looked at how they were financing it. And this was all so that we could give our policymakers good intelligence so they could hopefully make good, wise decisions. In the course of my career, I submitted many requests to the FISA court. FISA is Foreign Intelligence and Surveillance Act. It's overseen by a secret court, and they were always approved. <laughs> we now know that like 99.9% .9 of those are approved. But I will say at the time when we submitted these requests, those of us, my former colleagues that did so, did feeling that they were uh, genuinely well-vetted requests. These were really bad guys that we needed uh, further information on. So as we all know, 
We did go to a war with Iraq in March 2003, a decade ago. And after the shock and all, we found nothing. In July 2003, my husband, Ambassador Joe Wilson, wrote an op-ed piece for the New York Times entitled, What I Did Not Find in Africa. And in it, he accused the Bush administration of twisting and manipulating the intelligence to exaggerate the Iraqi nuclear threat. So to sell that to the American people, to sell the war to the American people. Remember how many times senior administrations told the American people there is an imminent nuclear threat and we don't want to see the smoking gun in the shape of a mushroom cloud. One week later, my name and covert status and employment with, with the CIA was disclosed in a col column by a conservative journalist. And it really was partisan payback for my husband speaking out and uh, challenging the administration's rationale for going to war with Iraq. The end of my covert career started a messy, ugly political scandal that ended with a conviction of then Vice President's Chief of Staff, Scooter Libby. So now, I'm a private citizen. I live with my family in New Mexico, and, but I'm still deeply passionate about national security issues, and it's in that capacity that I speak to you tonight. The issue at stake to be discussed this evening is the appropriate balance between national security and privacy. Ever since this story broke in June of this year about the NSA revelations, I have followed this very closely. As I said, I now live in New Mexico, and I totally understand how Washington, D.C., and that whole inside baseball world, particularly as we're seeing it playing out right now with all the issues at stake with the debt ceiling and so forth, can seem really far away and not relevant to our everyday lives. However, the Snowden revelations about the extent of the NSA surveillance in this country will be felt by each of us individually. It will have a profound impact. These issues matter deeply because they go to the core essence of our Constitution, in particular the Fourth Amendment, and the ever tense dynamic between security and privacy in a world that seems to have decreasing amounts of each. So let's take a moment and sort of review the bidding. What do we know so far? In June of this year, through a series of exposés in The Guardian, a UK newspaper, United Kingdom newspaper, journalist Glenn Greenwald with documentarian Lawyer Poitras broke the story about a former CIA employee and Booz, Adder, Booz Allen contractor, Edwin Snowden. Snowden had passed Greenwald a vast trove of documents on what Snowden thought was the illegal and overreach of the National Security Agency. We now know that the NSA has been secretly ordering phone companies such as Verizon and others to sweep up and hand over all the metadata from the phone calls of millions of its customers. And this includes phone numbers, duration of calls, routing information, and sometimes even the location of the callers. This collection actually started in the weeks and the months following the 9-11 attacks, when President Bush initiated warrantless domestic surveillance. As a result of this warrantless wiretapping program, high-ranking officials of his administration, including James Comey, who's now the head of the FBI, and his predecessor, Robert Mueller, they threatened to resign. They thought it was an overreach. Bush consequently backed off from some of those measures. But what happened then? Did Congress check this executive overreach? Did anyone hold them accountable? It did not. It adopted the worst features of the Bush program as law in the Protect America Act of 2007 and the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Amendment Act of 2008. Congress took the additional step of immunizing all those corporations involved in those programs from any legal repercussions. So far from correcting those abuses, Congress institutionalized them. And at the same time, it supported the executive branch's cloak of secrecy over these abuses and the classification of the legal opinions of the FISA court, whose rulings had given legal protection to the new surveillance programs. So, over the past decade, we know the NSA has secretly worked to gain access to virtually all communications entering, leaving, or going through the United States. Why would this be so? 
A key reason, according to a draft of a top secret NSA Inspector's General report leaked by Snowden, is that a, at least a third of international telephone calls in the world enter, leave, or transit the United States. They all go through a small number of switches or choke points en route to their uh, final destination. A, the United States is a major crossroads for international traffic. Here's what's more important. Virtually all internet communications in the world pass through the United States. So we've learned about two particular programs from Snowden. The first one is codenamed PRISM. PRISM gives the NSA access to data from inter individual internet companies such as Yahoo, Google, Microsoft. However, the companies claim they don't give the agency direct access to their servers. There's still a lot we don't know about how PRISM works, but basically it allows NSA to request data on specific people from all those major technology companies, Google, Yahoo, Facebook, and so forth. The government insists it's only allowed to collect data when given permission by the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. According to Snowden's documents, there is another more invasive program codenamed Upstream. And it's described as a collection of communications on fiber cables and infrastructure as the data flows past. So in contrast to PRISM, Upstream involves a collection of communications, both their metadata and content as they pass through undersea fiber optic cables. As part of this cable tapping program in Upstream, the NSA has installed what amounts to computerized filters in telecommunication infrastructure throughout the country. According to this leaked IG report that we have because of Snowden, the agency has secret cooperative agreements with at least the top three telephone companies in the country. The filters where all this data goes through are placed at key junction points known as switches. For example, almost all the information going in and out of northwestern United States passes through a nearly windowless nine-story building on Folsom Street in San Francisco. This is AT&T's regional switching center. In 2003, the NSA built a secret room in the facility and filled it with computers and software from a company called NARIS. Established in Israel by the Israelis, NARIS is now owned by Boeing, and it specializes in spyware and especially equipment that examines the metadata, the names and addresses of people communicating on the internet, all as it zooms by at the speed of light. According to William Binney, who is a former senior NSA official, the NSA has established between 10 and 20 of these secret rooms all over the country. It's this daily access to the telephone metadata of all Americans without FISA warrants that the NSA tried to hide when they falsely denied that the agency had surveillance records on millions of Americans. Let me talk to you a little bit about the man who runs this empire, General Keith Alexander. I don't know if anyone here has ever been to Fort Meade, which is the NSA headquarters just outside of Washington, sort of between Baltimore and Washington. It's a top secret city, and by city I mean tens of thousands of people move through more than 50 buildings. It has its own post office, fire department, police force. And this is the domain of General Keith Alexander, the man who runs the NSA. If he came in here and sat down, I doubt, I doubt hardly anyone in here would recognize him. But he, no one in American intelligence has come close to his degree of power. General Alexander is a four-star army general, and his authority extends across three domains. He is the director of the world's largest intelligence agency, the National Security Agency, he is chief of the Central Security Service, which is a military command, and commander of the U.S. Cyber Command. So he runs the nation's cyber war efforts, an empire he's built over the last eight years by insisting that the U.S.'s inherent vulnerability to digital attacks requires him to amass more and more authority over the data zipping around the globe. In his telling, the threat is so mind-boggling and so huge that the nation has little option but to eventually put the entire civilian internet under his protection, requiring tweets and emails to pass through his filters and putting the kill switch under the government's thumb. 
To quote him, he said, what we see is an increasing level of activity on the networks. He, he said this at a recent security conference. I'm concerned this is going to break a threshold where the private sector can no longer handle it and the government is going to have to step in. It's been reported that his mentality is captured by his motto, collect it all. The personality driving all of this, uh, not just Alexander's, but much of Washington's perhaps, is best captured in a profile that Foreign Policy Magazine put out that the NSA director, this Keith Alexander, prior to his position, um, he modeled a, more a war room after Star Trek's Enterprise, and the room was christened as part of the Information Dominance Center. I find, personally, I found this really alarming. I'm just gonna read this. Uh, when he was running the Army's Intelligence and Security Command, he brought many of his future allies down to Fort Belvoir for a tour of his base of operations in his facility known as Information Dominance Center. It had been designed, get this, by a Hollywood set designer to mimic the bridge of the Starship Enterprise from Starship, complete with chrome panels, computer stations, a huge TV monitor, and doors that made a whoosh sound when they <laughs> opened and closed. An important aspect of the story has been the focus on contractors, because when the news first broke about Snowden and that he was on contract to Booz Allen for the NSA, there was a huge outcry. How can this be? Well, I'm here to tell you, you just haven't been paying attention. The roots of this trend of contracting out to the private sector goes back at least as far to the Reagan era, when the political right became obsessed with limiting government and denigrating those who worked for the, pub, for the public sector. Began a wave of privatization and this whole concept uh, that everything was more cost efficient when done by the private sector. Last year, the Project on Government Oversight sent a letter to government officials poking holes in the Department of Defense's claims that it utilizes a cost-effective workforce. It showed that the contracting budget and spending data that of contractor employees to the Department of Defense cost nearly three times more than the average DOD civilian employee performing the same job. This new data highlights the fact that the federal government is contracting out services regardless of the extra cost. I can tell you today, as I follow the intelligence community very closely, it is so immense that no one person can manage or even comprehend its reach. My question is, when an operation of critical importance goes south, who do we prefer to try to correct that damage? Would it be a government employee whose loyalty belongs to their country, despite a modest salary, or the subcontractor who wants to assure that his much fatter paycheck keeps coming? I would recommend to you a book by Dana Priest, who writes for the Washington Post. She's a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. She wrote, I think it came out two years ago, Top Secret America with William Arkin. It came out in 2011. And it details the astounding growth in contractors and sort of what I call the military industrial intelligence complex since the 9-11 attacks. I can tell you, I, I go to Washington a couple times a year. I was just there recently, and every time I am taken with how it is absolutely a boom town. The billions of money, of money that is rushing out like a fountain under the whole rubric of homeland security. You see it in the millions of feet of office space. You see it in the crowded restaurants. You see it in the cranes on the sky. It, you know, it's no wonder that many of those in Washington really don't understand what's going on in the rest of the country. When these programs first became public knowledge, it seemed to me that there was sort of a huge shrug from Americans. Much more interested in Edward Snowden's flight from Hawaii to Hong Kong and then his long stay at the Moscow airport. Much more interested in it his pole dancing girlfriend. He was sort of the shiny ball that the media was racing after. My friends, and probably yours, didn't grasp at first what these revelations actually meant. Every, I felt like everyone was saying, well, I'm not a terrorist, what do I care? I don't care if the government has all my information. It's fine. Well, what's happened is we have become accustomed to this. We have voluntarily given up so much of our privacy. 
We know that already with, say, an online retailer like Amazon saying to you, well, if you bought these loafers, you're going to love these sandals, right? And most people under the age of 25, and I can say that as a, a, a mother of 13-year-old twins, they really don't understand privacy in the same way as those, say, over 25, because of the tremendous rise of social media, which has, on the positive side, you can keep in touch much more closely with loved ones and share photos and find out where your friends are for dinner. And on the downside, you've just about given away every last little bit of your privacy. What's the big deal? Let me tell you why it matters. To date, to date, there is no proof that the government has used this information to pursue and har harass US citizens based on their political views. There's no sort of J. Edgar Hoover-like enemy list yet. But history teaches us the accumulation of personal information about law-abiding citizens carries tremendous potential for abuse, including harassment of minorities, political enemies, and social activists. It cannot be that hard to envision a scenario where one of us you know, it's only a, what is a Kevin Bacon, this is uh, six steps away, um, to find someone who maybe is on the terrorist watch list. What then? You have no idea who this person is. But a supercomputer at Fort Meade, or the soon to be operational Utah data center near Salt Lake City, has made this connection. And the next thing you know, you have a knock on your door. On this spying business, Officials from the Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper, to very self-important senators are in effect telling Americans, don't worry, it's not that big a deal. Trust us. We're keeping Americans safe. What I say is this position must be turned on its head and open up to a genuine discussion about the necessary, about the necessary dynamic tension between security and privacy. President Obama said not that long ago that he, quote, welcomes the debate over the balance of security versus privacy, which is a wee bit disingenuous because we would not be having this debate if we had not known about these revelations. And just last week, Hillary Clinton said at Chatham House in London that we need to have a, quote, sensible adult conversation about the boundaries of state surveillance of our citizens in our democracies. Exactly. As it now stands, these programs are really ripe for abuse unless we establish ground rules and barriers between authentic national security interests and potential political chicanery. And I'm telling you, my husband Joe Wilson and I know a little bit about political chicanery. <laughs> Bruce Schneier, who's a cryptographer and an author on security topics has been working with the Guardian as they're going through these vast amount of data, all the documents that they have obtained uh, uh, from the NSA by Snowden. And he was asked, taken all together, what do we know? What does it reveal that we didn't know already? And he said, and I agree, it's not a big surprise to those of us watching the intelligence community. I mean, this, this is, uh, the, the Brazil was very upset that we were, you know, spying on them. But, you know, that, that those of us that follow this, what is amazing, however, is how robust the NSA surveillance is, how pervasive, and to what degree the NSA has commandeered the entire internet and turned it into an internet a surveillance platform, excuse me. He was asked, well, you know, the NSA's mission is national security. How is this snooping really going to affect the average person? His answer was, and I agree, is that these NSA actions are making us all less safe. They're not just spying on the bad guys. They're deliberately weakening internet security for everyone, including the good guys. And it's sheer folly, he said, to believe that only the NSA can exploit the vulnerabilities they create. The internet, of course, is essential to our lives, and it's been subverted into a gigantic surveillance platform. The solutions, solutions must be political, and he said the best advice for the average person is to agitate for political change. This scandal is no longer about privacy or a particular violation of constitutional or legislative obligations. 
It's gone much beyond that. And I saw a metaphor that really caught my eye. It said that the American body politic is suffering a severe case of autoimmune disease, that our defense system is attacking other critical systems of our body. People I respect argue that if we do not ruthlessly expand our intelligence capabilities, we'll suffer terrorism and defeat. And they say whatever minor tweaks are necessary, the argument goes, the core of the operation is absolutely necessary and people will die if we falter. But for me, the question still remains, how much of what we have is really necessary and effective and how much is bureaucratic bloat resulting in the all too familiar dynamics of organizational self-aggrandizement and expansionism. We need fundamental organizational reform. The so-called Outside Independent Experts Committee, which the President has appointed with insiders insiders like Michael Morrell and Richard Clark, don't come close to doing the trick. It has been suggested that maybe the NSA needs to be put into a sort of receivership and insiders beginning at the very top need to be removed and excluded from the restructuring process. It was their expertise that led to this mess and it would be a hindrance, not a help, in cleaning it up. We need a forceful, truly independent outsiders with strong direct congressional support who would recruit former insider dissenters like Thomas Drake or William Binney to reveal where the bodies are buried. I'm gonna conclude with a quote from Senator Frank Church, and this is really prescient, considering he said this in 1975. He himself, as some of you may know, was in fact also the target of NSA surveillance decades ago. So it's a long quote, but it's worth it, so stay with me. He says, the capability at any time could be turned around on the American people, and no American would have any privacy left, such as the capability to monitor everything telephone conversations, telegrams, it doesn't matter. There'd be no place left to hide. If this government ever became a tyranny, if a dictator ever took charge in this country, the technological capacity that the intelligence community has given the government could enable it to impose total tyranny. And there'd be no way to fight back because the most careful effort to combine together in resistance to the government, no matter how privately it was done, is within the reach of the government to know. Such is the capability of this technology. I don't want to see this country ever go across the bridge. I know the capacity that there is to make tyranny total in America, and we must see to it that this agency and all agencies that possess this technology operate within the law and under proper supervision so that we never cross over that abyss. That is the abyss from which there is no return. And mind you, that was spoken in 1975. Senator Church has certainly absorbed the lessons of George Orwell's 1984. And I would say from the recent evidence, there are still a lot of lessons to be learned. I thank you for your time, and I really look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie Plame. You're listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, broadcast from Westminster Presbyterian Church on Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. I'm Tim Hart Anderson, senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church and moderator of the forum. Our speaker tonight is national security expert, Valerie Plame. While the ushers collect questions from the in-house audience, I'd like to invite the radio audience to join us here at Westminster Church on Thursday evening, November 7 at 7 p.m for a conversation with Howard G. Buffett and his son, Howard W. Buffett, on the topic, Finding Hope in a Hungry World. Visit our website, westminsterforum.org, for more information on our upcoming events. And now, Ms. Plame, if you would return to the pulpit, I will present the questions from our audience. When I ask a question uh, uh, a little bit in a different direction from where you've been heading. You, you've been on the inside of the intelligence community. Uh, and uh, I wonder if you might share with us, if you can, some instances where collecting intelligence has actually done some good for the country. <laughs> 
Yeah, it, as the saying goes, it's always easy to point out the mistakes made, right? But the successes are unheralded. I was really proud to serve my country. I loved my job, and if none of that had happened in 2003, I would be uh, I would be overseas right now, collecting my government paycheck, but doing work that I really, uh, from which I derived a great sense of satisfaction. Uh, a, a terrific success that I can talk about because it has been made public. I was fortunate enough to work with some of the people that were responsible for bringing down uh, A.Q. Khan, who is the Pakistani nuclear scientist who for decades uh, was essentially a nuclear entrepreneur. He would sell any nuclear technology or widget you wanted at the right price. He is now more or less under house arrest in Pakistan, but his tentacles spread worldwide. And he was very much involved in uh, selling uh, nuclear technology to Libya. And if you, re you recall, in December 2003, uh, they were caught red-handed. And Libya essentially said, uncle, OK, we're not going to do that anymore. So uh, that's a, a very public case that I can talk to you about, a great success. Uh, and I continue to work, as you mentioned in the introduction. I work with a group called Global Zero. Uh, which works toward a world without nuclear weapons. I've sort of evolved in my viewpoint when I worked for the CIA. I was so busy into operations, I was doing things to sort of delay, deter, do what you can to stop uh, nuclear proliferation, or at least give a chance for diplomacy and other politics to work. But I've moved a little bit down the continuum now where I really believe we have to put zero as our ultimate objective. We have to go to that. We've just been lucky so far. What do you think about Snowden leaking the information? Uh, I, th I think a lot of people, when they ask me that, maybe expect me to say, oh, that was terrible. He's, you know, there's uh, putting people at risk and so forth and operations. And that may be true. That, that has not yet actually been demonstrated. Um, what I think is the issue of whether he is a whistleblower and heroic or whether he is a traitor will ultimately be decided. But he is irrelevant to the issues that I just spoke about. That's where we have to have our conversation. Uh, and I think, uh, as I mentioned, President Obama said, we need to have a, a robust conversation on this. He welcomes that debate. Indeed, we do. And we would not be having that debate if it were not for the revelations from Snowden. I'll say one more thing on that, which is uh, we now know that there are about 1.4 million Americans with a top secret security clearance. Edward Snowden was one of them. When you have that many people with a top secret security clearance, is it any wonder that maybe you have a 22-year-old private, Bradley Manning, now Chelsea Manning, or someone like Snowden, who, whatever their motivations, uh, comes forward and says, this is, this is something I feel that my conscience tells me I need to do. One of our listeners says, we had no interest in Snowden's flight from Hawaii, <laughs> but the media seemed upset with it or obsessed by it. Mm -hmm. How can we get the media to do its job to inform us? Mm. Oh, that's whole conversation, isn't it? <laughs> Let me back up a bit. In the run-up to the war with Iraq, uh, I had a front row seat. I was working, as I mentioned, on a rock WMD, the operations at CIA headquarters. And my husband, Joe Wilson, was very actively involved in that debate leading up to the war. He had served as our charge d'affaires uh, at the embassy in Baghdad during the first Gulf War. He had met with Saddam Hussein. He was responsible for helping to negotiate the release of hundreds of American hostages during that first war. And the first President Bush called him a true American hero. So he was very much engaged in that whole debate. And maybe you don't remember this, it's a decade ago, but uh, since I was there and watching it very carefully, 
I know that those that said, wait a minute, this might not be in our, in our national interest to do this, the, the, I would say, you know, you were called a traitor or, and worse for even suggesting that maybe we need to have a more uh, substantial conversation before we undertake the most serious of our obligations as a country, which is to send our sons and our daughters to kill and die in our name. And the media, particularly in Washington, you saw this, it, it was exposed more than ever, the truly symbiotic relationship. There are reporters that, of course, want access to the White House. Uh, they need to do that for their stories. But then, you know, if they, maybe some of the reporting is not liked by the administration, they are denied access, which is not good for their career, much less their, uh, their networks. Uh, I don't have a simple answer to that, only that we need to continue to press our media, ask those questions. Maybe if we had asked, had the media ask more invasive questions in the run-up to the war with Iraq of like, what are you gonna do the day after? What are you, uh, you know, what is the planning? How is this going to affect, uh, we would not be Looking back, I think this country does with great regret with our actions uh, in Iraq. I was somewhat heartened to see that despite the truly horrific pictures that everyone saw in August with the uh, chemical gas attack in Syria, and there was a hue and cry, we must do something. The American people, though, clearly fatigued by our military adventures over the last decade, sort of with more or less one voice said, what are we gonna do? What, how is this going to make things better? How, what, and furthermore, we're not even sure that those that are against the Assad regime are really going to be on our side after you know, the next day. And so we did pull back, and there does seem to be uh, some you know, very good progress. They're, they, through a variety of, of several events that led us to the point where they are destroying their chemical arsenal now, so now they can kill each other by more conventional means. But um, it's, it's really the role of the media in this is critical, and we as citizens need to push and keep asking those questions. Are we twisting intelligence about Iran's nuclear program? It feels like a similar buildup to the Iraq situation. I believe tomorrow talks start in Geneva at a very high level between Iran and the United States on the issue of Iran's nuclear, clearly they, they desire a nuclear weapon. And I am heartened by that because it's the first time since the revolution that uh, the, uh, the Iranian revolution, that we've had diplomatic talks at that level. That's huge. Uh, imagine with your friends that you haven't spoken to in some weeks or months or even years, how the potential for misunderstanding, miscommunication grows, right, when you don't speak. The same thing goes with nation states. I, I don't believe that diplomatic relations should be uh, parceled out like you know, ice cream cones for those we like. I think the United States is great enough that we can speak to our enemies and our friends alike. And I am really pleased that we are finally sitting down. <laughs> Iran has clearly been deeply hurt by the sanctions that we've imposed on them. But they also want to rejoin the community of nations. I believe that. Uh, there, is a, there is a lot of interesting things that are swirling around right now, but I think any time that you begin to have that dialogue of what's in their best national interest and what's in our best national interest, um, you, can, you can start someplace. And uh, I'm, very, I'm gonna be following that very carefully. How does the scope and effectiveness of NSA digital information monitoring compare with that of other countries, say China, for instance? I'm not an expert. Uh, it clearly, China uh, or is very much using their capabilities offensively. 
But from what I have read in, in preparation for my remarks this evening and everything that I've seen, I think NSA's capabilities are uh, certainly uh, superior. I'm not saying that by any means that you take anyone else's, uh, any other country's attempts at doing the same thing casually or underestimate them. But uh, my, the point of my remarks this evening is we really need to pay attention to how this will affect all of us and ask those questions and find people that think like you to say, wait a minute, is this really how we want to set up our democracy or to, to, can do, to be in this society, in this democracy? democracy? Does the U.S. government look more foreboding or ominous to you now that you're on the outside <laughs> compared to how it looked when you were on the inside? Ah. There is a little, to, something to be said for <laughs> when you're sort of in the water swimming with the other fish and you, know, you, don't, you don't realize that you're in water, right? And then when I resigned from the CIA in 2007, because obviously my covert career was over, I thought I had the best job in the world, I could no longer continue. Um, and then you step away, you go, huh, that was a little strange, wasn't it? Uh, but living that cover and living that life, and of course I give you a lot of training to go into it, um, it, I never found it particularly strange. I mean, it was, uh, I loved working on counterproliferation issues. I loved living and working abroad. Uh, I had some, I met some amazing people along the way. When you, whether you're in the CIA or serve in the diplomatic service or serve in the military, when you are overseas, you are not serving as a Democrat or a Republican, right? You are serving as an American. And that was definitely my mindset. Uh, when we were back in Washington and all of this happened in terms of the leak of my CIA identity in 2003 and the resultant, uh, the consequences of that, I certainly paid much closer attention to politics than I ever had before. But I have to say, honestly, it seemed the entire country sort of, there was some seminal shift, some polarization that happened after the election of 2000. When I was growing up, it was sort of considered poor form to talk about politics, right, at the dinner table, and no one has those inhibitions anymore, uh, which is, goes both ways. But uh, I am concerned, uh, just as a private citizen now, of, of course, what we're seeing in the news right now, it, it seemingly inability to govern, to come to any sort of compromise, to find practical solutions, and uh, on the issues that I just spoke about this evening of uh, security versus privacy. Do you have any evidence or suspicion that your communication is being monitored now? <laughs> Well, I will tell you that my co-author, who's Sarah Lovett, and she also lives in New Mexico by, uh, by coincidence, uh, she, we work together on blowback, and it is fictional, okay? It's a spy thriller. But I will tell you that a lot of times our communications don't get through to each other, a lot. And I, 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 uh, I, I don't know, I, I would, uh, who knows? Uh, clearly there is um, a big net out there, a big, big net. We should know that the NSA doesn't need to listen in tonight. They can hear you tomorrow on NPR <laughs> at noon. How, con how convenient. <laughs> how convenient. How would any of us know that we are being monitored by the government? Um, I refer, I was, in preparing my remarks for this evening, I was looking at that and, and people who I look to that are a lot smarter on those issues than I am say basically we're in trouble. There is no way, a lot of back doors have been built into uh, the internet security uh, products that are out there because the government knocks on the door of the company that's making them and says, Yo, okay, this is very all, all very well and good that you have your private communications, but um, in case there's any sort of terrorist action, we need to be able to get into this. And you may have heard uh, over the summer, there were some of these private encryption firms that actually closed their doors rather than 
allow the government turning over their sort of uh, customer list to the government. And they were really, I've listened to some of their interviews, they're extremely prescribed from what they can say publicly. I mean, they can't even say publicly, yeah, the government won't let me do this. They, they have to really just talk around it. But I find that frightening. I, there is no guarantee of safety, right? There is no guarantee of safety. That is part of the, that is the human condition. So how much are we willing to give up I've flown a lot within the last two weeks on this book tour, and you know, every time I stand in line and take off my shoes, um, I think, you know, how much are we going to give up to continue? Feel as a, is it a false sense of security? If we follow the money, where do we end up? Who, especially, is profiting from the privatization of security? <laughs> Well, as I said, just go to Washington, D.C. Really. It is boomtown, folks. It, the money there is unbelievable. And this comes from, out, I think the, the, the figures are somewhere between estimates between 60 and 70 percent of the intelligence budget goes to contractors. What? Really? Um, I agree, there are some things that can be done more effectively, more cost efficient in the private sector. But I don't think we should be, hand we should be giving them core, core intelligence mission work. And they say they're not supposed to, and then they don't do that, but that's not how it happens in reality. So who is profiting? The, I would say those that have those really nice government contracts. Um, and they go, it's billions and billions and billions of dollars that we have spent in the last decade as a result of the 9-11 attacks and our need for security at the expense, I would say, of things like infrastructure, education, jobs, you know, you know the list. Say something about your personal background, if you would. How did you end up working for the CIA? Who were your role models growing up? What put you in that direction? I think what I can say, I can't tell you specifics or how old I was uh, when I joined the CIA because the agency has taken the position that I'm not permitted to acknowledge any agency affiliation prior to 2002. Sorry. I dropped from the sky. Uh, but what I can tell you is this. So I come from a family where public service is considered something something noble. Maybe that sounds corny. Okay, so my, my dad fought in World War II in the South Pacific. He was an Air Force officer. My brother uh, served and was wounded in Vietnam as a Marine. My mother was a public school teacher. So when I was given this opportunity to join the CIA, uh, I left, I, it sounded, first of all, it sounded like a lot more interesting than what any of my friends were doing. And I was delighted that the government was going to pay me to live and work overseas. Uh, and as I said, I, I, I love my job. And growing up, I can't say that, <laughs> I can't say that I grew up thinking that working for the CIA or espionage was a, a viable career option. I didn't, I didn't think that at all. Uh, but it sort of fell in my lap. And uh, although I, I think back now, and I really did enjoy Harriet the Spy. You know that book? <laughs> Thank you for revealing that secret. <laughs> now, now that security agencies have gotten a taste of near total surveillance, is putting the genie back in the bottle even possible? Is resistance futile? <sighs> I'm, a, I'm an optimist by nature. We, we are at the point, you wonder, what is the tipping point? There is no constituency, really, in terms of pushing back against such a vast, as I call it, the military industrial intelligence complex, right? There's not a whole lot of money in it. You're not going to see lobbyists giving millions of dollars to their congressmen and women to say, you know, you really need to downsize here. It's just way too big. Um, but where it can be changed is as it always is in a democracy. You find like-minded people. You find uh, the candidates 
who support your viewpoint, you, begin, you are engaged, whether that is at a local level, serving on your local library board or whatever, you know, stuffing envelopes for a candidate you believe in. Or, I mean, there's so many ways to be engaged. And I, there are days, as these days are, very disheartening to be a citizen of this country. But I am slightly heartened when I remember um, Winston Churchill's quote, which he says, democracy is the worst form of government, except for all the others that have been tried. Uh, if the president were to call you and ask you to come to the Oval Office <laughs> and make two or three suggestions about the military industrial intelligence complex, ah. what would you say? Oh, that's such an overwhelming question, isn't it? Uh, first, I'd want to make sure that, you know, I had the right shoes and... <laughs> overwhelming. Um, I would speak to him uh, if he would give me, you know, getting uh, 30 seconds of the president's time is absolutely precious, but I'd try to condense what I just said down into that 30 seconds. Uh, and he is obviously uh, got a long to-do list, a long to-do list, I'm, sh I'm sure. There are days when he wakes up, he goes, oh, I'm still the president. <laughs> um, but I am, I do know that one of his, one of his personal feeling, uh, one of his personal things that he wants to accomplish, and you know that he's thinking about legacy, even in the midst of these really terrible, anxious days. And something he feels personally about is continuing to reduce working on reducing the nuclear arsenals of the US and Russia. We still have the preponderance of nuclear weapons, 90% in the world. And this is somewhere that he has made tremendous progress. He has moved the needle for the first time. Uh, and so I might use maybe 15 seconds of that time to like keep encouraging to do that because uh, with all the problems that we have, and we do have a lot, if you do not get that one right, the nuclear issue and the proliferation, let me tell you, none of the other ones matter. It appears that our right to privacy continues to erode. For instance, I'm still unhappy that anyone can look into my backyard thanks to Google Maps. <laughs> what can an ordinary citizen do? This is really hard. Again, from my research on this, that, you know, I've asked that question. We, the internet now is an integral part of our lives. I don't know who's willing to live on cash economy, you know, just cash. Um, it, it, the internet brings this tremendous amount of advantages. As a, you know, you get all kinds of things delivered right to your door. Uh, <clears throat> I, I go back to, it has to be, we are in a democracy. And uh, it has to go back to political solutions. And if this is something that you care about, you find those that are in office that are concerned. Most recently, we have seen a, a great deal on this issue from uh, Senators Ron Wyden and uh, Senator Udall, who have spoken out again and again and again to say, wait a minute, what are we doing here on on the NSA, this is a tremendous overreach. They're always very careful with their words not to go into any sort of classified territory, but those are two senators that come to mind that have really worked very hard on this issue. What can we do to protect our children and youth from the dangers you warn us about loss of privacy? <laughs> what do you do to protect your two 13-year-old twins? I lurk. <laughs> I lurk on Facebook. My, my, so I have a son and a daughter, 13-year-old twins, and in typical developmental fashion, it's my daughter who is much more social and finds uh, all of that much more alluring. My son tends to just text, you know, sup to his friends. <laughs> sup. So I told my that I would just speak from my, my, what I have been doing personally. I allowed, she had 13, she really wanted a Facebook account, and up till that point I had been able to say, it's illegal to do it before you're 13. Uh, but at 13, she can open an account, and I told her that um, I had to open up an account, but I said, I'm going, to be, I'm going to be watching everything that comes in and goes out, not because of you, 
but because you know it's a big wide world out there and of course the potential is we're hearing more and more about bullying online bullying all of that um, it, it, you just want to watch everything that comes in and goes out and I tell you it is such a I feel like a fuddy-duddy and I'm not but keeping up with whatever you know snapchat was the thing for a while then it's instagram all of these things which i try to tell myself that this is actually good is keeping my synapses moving i'm not you know stuck in 1980s you know uh but it, it requires constant vigilance as though parenting teenagers isn't hard enough right there's this whole new wave of things that you need to be aware of and how uh, I think schools are really going to have to step up a lot more. Uh, they, so far, they've been able to say, oh, what happens outside of school is not our, is not our concern. But in fact, it, it comes, it, it's such a part of our lives now, whether it's uh, you know, bullying or whatever it might be. So I see a growth industry there uh, over the next decade. It's been 10 years since you were outed in Robert Novak's column. How do you feel about that now, a decade later? How do you feel about him? Which part? Well, he's dead. I know, but <laughs> about his. <laughs> Just saying. You're not. You're not suggesting. <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, not but suggesting. in terms of how, how do you feel? How do you feel about that experience at the time? So it's been a decade, and I'm really grateful that it's been a decade. Time and space, as I mentioned, we moved from Washington to New Mexico, and that has been very helpful. We've been busy rebuilding our lives, professionally and personally. Uh, it was a really searing experience, but, you know, millions of people lose their jobs all the time, and you need to figure it out and put your shoes on, lace them up, and keep walking forward. Uh, what was really helpful was that we had then small children and they really don't care how your day was. They really just want your affection and your love and your attention. And having, you know, to, to be able to concentrate on them and move away from what could otherwise be completely toxic self-absorption <laughs> uh, was probably really mentally healthy. We have time for one more question. Okay. Given the state of Washington today and what you know about it, are you hopeful about America and its future? And I can always joke about it, of course, but right, we're on, the, we're on the eve. We don't really know where this country is going to be going in the next few days and months. How is this going to happen? I am optimistic because I do a lot of speaking to young people in universities, and they are bright and engaged and caring. Uh, and I always encourage them to consider public service. The other thing I'm encouraged about is when I see what comes under this rubric of called social entrepreneurs, right? Where they're, use, they're using the power of technology to solve problems. It used to be just sort of, well, nonprofits, but now that it's just sort of like been blown up. And when you see what you can see in some of the problem solving of the world in places like in the TED Talks and so forth, that we go, okay. I mean, I think it's always a race between for the human race between education and catastrophe. Which one's gonna win, right? We don't, we're, we're trying, can we innovate and educate ourselves out of, uh, you know, out of the mess that we, the big hole that we as humans have dug for ourselves? Um, I hope the answer is yes. Um, I just saw that, I'll end on this, that uh, Paul McCartney just put out a new album, the first one in six years. And one of his songs, the lyrics to one of his songs says something like, before you go, try to do something good, right? And that's all you can do. You try to take whatever you've been given, whatever's positive, pass it along in whatever form that might be. And that's all you can hope for, that you do a little bit of good in this world before you go on. Thank you, Valerie. Thank Plan. you.